of the Lord today. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Well, what a beautiful, sunshiny day today. Isn't it awesome outside? Isn't it great that the S-O-N is going to shine even brighter and brighter and brighter in here today? Amen. Those of you that are joining us by online live streaming that, welcome uh, to River of Life Church, and we want you to enter in and just uh, feel a part of our family, and we, we love you and we thank you for joining us today. Uh, how many of you realize that around the world um, it's upside down and it's all in chaos? But aren't you glad that God's not in chaos? That God's always in control, amen? And through all of it, God's will is going to be done. And uh, every day I look at what's going on and I just go like, Lord, we're all one, one day closer to you coming back. Hallelujah. And I give God all the praise for that and give him glory. Stand with me, if you will, and we're going to ask the Lord to be with us, and we're going to meet and greet and uh, we just worship the Lord. So if you're all ready in the back there for the meet and greet, uh, Father, thank you for this great day. Thank you, Lord, that we're in your house. And, Lord, those that are on their way, Lord, bring them safely. And, Lord, we just pray for your will perfectly to be done today. And we give you all the praise in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Let's take a few moments to just meet and greet each other. Amen. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your as you are to worship come just as you are before your God come one day every tongue will confess you are God one day every knee will bow
Everyone can be seated. Did you come to worship the Lord today? Did you come to worship Him today? You know, He, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? He is our Savior. He is your Redeemer. Amen? Um, are you... I just want to praise God today. I look out and see all your faces today. And I want to give Him glory. You want to give Him glory for everything that He, is, that he has done for us. Amen. We want to welcome everybody this morning. And we're so glad that you're here. Um, if this is your first time here, we welcome you. And we know that God has something in store for you. Everything is done for a purpose and a reason. He's got a plan, and it is an awesome plan. He has a plan for our lives, amen? And when we come to him, he fixes everything, and he takes care of stuff. When we come to him and we surrender, amen, because he's brought us out from afar. All of us were far, and we were alienated from him. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, amen? And he hung on a cross, he rose that third day, and he is alive and when you, when, he, when you allow him to come into your heart, he sets you free. Amen? Amen. Um, I'm going to read a, in Psalms 107. You said something this morning. so It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. He says, Let the redeem of the Lord say so. He says, Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Amen? Okay, he have, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. This is a kind of a God we serve, amen? amen. I wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way and I found no city to dwell in. Hungry. And thirsty, my soul fainteth. Then when I cried unto the Lord in my trouble, and he delivered me, delivered me out of my distress. The Bible says he delivers us all out of our distress. You know, there's a world out there that is crying and is in distress. There are souls that are hungry and they're thirsting. And we have the greatest news that there ever is. You know what? In this world we live in today, I don't listen to the news no more. On. There's only, there's only one news, Amen. and it's the news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That, that gave his life for you. He gave his life for your family, your friends, your employer, your employees. Um, all the one, your friends, everyone that's around you that you meet. Jesus Christ died. You know what? And when they call out, no matter what we might see, when they call out that name, no matter what, he will deliver them. Amen? Yeah. Did he deliver you? I yeah. know. I can look around this room. Yeah. And he, God delivered us out of everything. Amen? <laughs> Verse 7. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city, a habitation. Whoa, are you, you know, God has got a city. He's got a place for us, amen? And, he, and we resign in that, we rest in that. He has a place for each and every one of us, amen? And when we have a city here in camp, and we have a great city, and this, we're not done, God ain't done with this city, and this town, this area. But I'll tell you what, we can have joy today, amen. Do you have joy? Yeah. Are you going to rejoice and give him glory? Because yeah. we have a city that awaits us. But you know what? I don't want to go there by myself. I want, I want everybody that I meet to go with us, amen. We, we need to go to the highways and to the byways. Amen. And, and bring the, and bring in the sheaves. Amen. Bring in his children. God 
gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Are you ready to rejoice today? Amen. 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 Give him some praise this morning. Amen. He's a good God. Deserves our praise. Are there any farmers in the house? <laughs> Anybody that likes to garden? Try to. Now, Deb and I have a 30-foot wide by 120-foot long garden plot, about 3,600 wow. square feet. And uh, I've got it all tilled up. I've got it all rowed up, but if I stop there, guess what? I've just got a plowed up yard. <laughs> Amen? Yes. A lot of times that's what we do in our lives. We get it tilled up, we get it rowed up, but we never plant. <laughs> and if you never plant, you never reap a harvest, isn't that right? So. You know, I'm about reaping a harvest, Jeremy. I want some fruit for my labor. So I like good, good fresh tomatoes and, and peppers and beans and corn and all that stuff that comes out of that garden. It's not like the stuff you buy in the store. Walmart didn't make it. It came out of my garden. And so, you know, you and I are garden plots. If we've accepted Christ, he's tilled us up, he's rode us up, and got us ready to be planted. Amen? Amen? But if we never plant, we'll never do anything for Christ. That's right. That's right. There are a lot of people in the world who bounce from church to church to church who are not planted, who never produce anything. And so we're thankful for you today that you have chosen to, to be planted here in this place, that you've allowed God to plant you here. And, and for everything that you bring into this church, so that we can plant in other fields around the world and in our community. Amen? And so, thank you so much for being here and allowing God to plant you here. Here in this church, we don't pass an offering plate. We don't beg for money. We don't have to beg for money. You know why? Because God is our source. And he's chose to plant you here to help us meet the goals of this church and the needs of this church and the missions that we serve around the world. And so we want to say thank you for that. If it's your first time, we don't pass offering buckets. We don't have you come to the front and make a public show of giving. We simply have baskets by the double doors there that you drop your offering into. It's between you and God what you do. But you know, when you plant a garden, it, it will grow. The, the word says... Be not deceived, in Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. Whatsoever a man soweth, yes. that shall he also reap. So my question for you today is, what are you planting? Come on, man. <laughs> what are you planting in your garden? Come on. Are you planting joy and hope and peace and love Amen. and, and Amen. all of those things that God wants us to be, the nine spiritual fruits? All of that needs to be planted in our garden so that we can That's reap right. and multiply, amen? That's right. So that we can bless not only ourselves, but that we can bless others amen. through our life, amen? amen. Pastor. Amen. Y'all ready to worship the Lord? Amen. Good, because if you are, then I know they are. <laughs> are y'all ready to worship the Lord today? Amen, amen. Um, I'm going to uh, share something that happened this morning, but I'm not going to use any names. Uh, so if it was you, don't raise your hand or don't do anything. <laughs> no names. But um, just to share what happens, what, what Brother Ben was saying, uh, someone this morning uh, gave their last amount of money uh, in the offering this morning. is all they had, and they dropped it in the basket. They didn't have anything else. And within just a short time, someone came to them and gave them the same amount that they put in the basket. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, what we call an, it's what we call an on-time God. Amen. Amen. But those, those stories are they're everywhere. They're, they're in your life because God has done things like that for you. 
And uh, we used to have an old guy. His name was Earl Cribb. My brother knows him. And he's just a real, uh, James, he is about your size. So I was going to say real big. <laughs> about James's size. And uh, he would always say that you could never outgive God. And he'd always use the example, if I give a spoonful, uh, God will give a shovel full. If I give a shovel full, he'll bring in a backhoe. Uh, and he's just trying to really get everybody to realize you can't outgive God. Amen. Because God blesses us in so many, many, many ways. Amen. So I, I just thank God, and I wanted to share that testimony. Because sometimes we're going to talk a little bit about seeking first his kingdom today. And how when we do that, how God meets so many of our needs, amen, and supplies those needs. And uh, I lost $9,000 last week, and I couldn't find it. Uh, it was floating around somewhere in cyberspace, and we had transferred some money, and uh, nobody could find it. Nobody knew where it was. And I'm going like, I can't lose $9,000. <laughs> I can't even afford to lose nine dollars, right? let alone that amount of money. And I went up to the bank, and they they were doing all kinds of traces on it. And I, I come back to the office, and I'm just saying, God, you you've got to get this finances. I mean, this has got to show up in the bank over there because uh, that's just too much money. And uh, I I hadn't prayed the prayer, but about a moment. And I got a text and says, we found the money. It's in our account now. And I didn't even want to ask where it was. <laughs> I'm just glad you found it, all right? It's out there floating around somewhere. But uh, God meets all of our needs and supplies so many of our needs. And, and, and when Ben is up here each week um, and sharing with you, he's talking to you about the blessings of giving and the blessings of uh, and the joys that we have when we give unto the Lord, whether it's our finances or our time, our talent, gifting, whatever it might be, God always blesses us abundantly above and beyond what we could ever hope for. Amen. And I just want you guys to be super blessed. Um, do I want all of you to be a millionaire? No, because you'd move to Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want you blessed. <laughs> no, some wouldn't move to Dallas, no matter what. Uh, we we love you, and, and we want you to be blessed. And uh, we just are so grateful for what God does for us. Let's all stand. We're going to worship the Lord. Amen. <laughs> of you know that we are the house of the Lord. So the joy that you bring to the house of the Lord is right here. The joy is in you. So declare that there is joy in the house of the Lord today. We are that joy. We are the joy in the house of the Lord. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, we won't be quiet. Gonna shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. Gonna shout out your praise. Gonna shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Gonna shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. 
Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Gonna shout out your praise. Gonna shout out your praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Gonna shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Gonna shout out your praise. 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 There is joy. There is joy in this house. Gonna shout out your praise. Gonna shout out your praise. There is joy, there is joy in this house. Gonna shout out your praise. We always have a reason to praise. Always, no matter, no matter what comes our way, we have a reason to praise. Whether it's because we have food on our table or we have a bed to sleep in, we have a reason to praise each and every day. No matter how bad it seems, guys, there's always, always a reason to praise. When I'm at my age, you're just getting started when I hit a wall. You just walk through when I face the mountain. You are the maker, so it's gotta move. When I'm out of faith, you are. Still faithful when I'm at my worst, you are still good. And all of my questions, you are the answer. It all points to you. You're the God of the breakthrough. When I'm breaking down, you'll be working a way through. When there's no way out, this one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason to praise, praise, praise. of the cross flows rivers of grace and out of the grave 
burst a revival no doom can contain you're the god of the breakthrough when i'm breaking down you'll be working a way through and there's no way I, this one thing i know you're still on your throne so whatever i'm feeling i still got a reason to praise 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 i still got a reason to praise praise come around dry bones they come to life deserts to paradise stones just start rolling away when you come around my heart starts to beat again a long stretch to breathe you in souls just erupt in the praise when you come around the dry bones they come to life, deserts to paradise, stones just start rolling away. When you come around, my heart starts to beat again, my long stretch to breathe you in, souls just erupt in the prayer. the God of the breakthrough. When I'm breaking down, you'll be working a way through. And there's no way I, this one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason to praise. Praise, praise, I still got a reason to praise, 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 I still got a reason to praise. I still got a reason to praise you keep moving you keep working I still got it I still got a reason to praise you keep speaking you keep acting I still got it I still got a reason to praise you keep speaking you keep acting i still got i still got a reason to
of simplicity It brings me down to my knees I praise you for eternity Lord, I love you Because you You first love me It's the beauty of simplicity It fills me with eternity I've tasted your divinity Lord, I love you because you were first of me. And all God's people say,
Jesus this morning. I am so 
But you, Lord, I am so in love with you. There is no one else for me. Let's fall in love with Jesus. I am so in love with you. There is no one.
Amen. The song says he's worthy of it all. Everything. He is so worthy of it all, even that one or two little areas that you still haven't given to him yet. You're holding on to them. You're holding on to them because you like them. Or they've got a grip on you. The song says he's worthy of all of it. All of our praise, all of our honor, all of our glory, and all of the things that we think we can handle by ourselves. He's so powerful, He's so worthy. We can give all of that to Him, and He'll take them. He'll take them. The biggest challenge I've seen in over 50 years of preaching is not that He won't take them. It's either we don't want to give them to Him, or else we give them to Him for a moment, then we pick them back up and think we can do it ourselves. I'm going to encourage you. He's worthy of it all. So we're going to sing that portion of it one more time. And whatever it is that you might be holding on to in your life, He's worthy of everything. Give it to Him. And in essence, what we're saying, He's worthy of you. He died for you on the cross. He's worthy for you to give Him not 90%, not 99%. But he's worthy enough to give him 100% of who you are and give all of you unto him. Amen? So give it all to him as we worship the Lord. While we're worshiping him and we're singing that, you have a new song in your heart, release it. Just let God be magnified in the new song. If you want to offer up a prayer while we're singing it, offer up a prayer. This house, you have liberty. I don't try to manipulate it. I just want God to do what God wants to do. Amen. All I know one thing is I'm tired of dry churches. I'm tired of formality where you just go in and say amen and go home. It's going to take more than that to get through what we're heading into. It's going to take a real deep relationship with God. So let's worship the Lord in that song again. The latter part of that, He's worthy of it all. If some areas of your life you need to surrender to Him, give them to Him. Say, Lord, you're worthy of all of me, so here I am. I give this part up that I've been holding on to for so long. And then just worship the Lord. Amen. Let's magnify Him for a moment. Lord, we give it all to you today. Every bit of who we are. Lord, the deep, dark secrets in our corners of our heart, we give them to you. Lord, you're worthy of 100% of who we are. Father, we surrender that to you, Lord Jesus, right now. You need to surrender it to the Lord. Just give it to God right now. There's an anointing of the Holy Spirit right now. You need to give a portion of what you've been holding back on. Give it to God right this moment. The altar's open. You can kneel where you are. You can stand. Makes no difference. But you need to surrender what that area of your life is right now that you're holding on to. You're holding on to it because you think you got no strength to surrender it. Well, you don't, but God does. You're holding it on because you don't know what's going to replace it. God does. So whatever that area is in your life this morning, we're going to worship the Lord as we sing it again. The altar is open for you to come wherever you're at. Hallelujah.
here praying, just go ahead and worship the Lord right where you're at. Just worship Him. Pray and surrender everything unto Him right now. Father, we just surrender ourselves to You, Lord. Lord, let Your name be glorified. Let Your name be glorified today. Oh, Lord, we lift Your name to You. give that word now. As I was sitting there just listening to the Lord, he, he began to speak to me about people who are coming and going, not planting, and expecting their life to change. And he said, if we want change to come in our lives, we must get planted. We must stay. We have no root. And therefore, we have no life. And we need to get planted, get the life that God wants in us so that he can use us the way that he wants to. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Amen. God is good, isn't he? How many of you felt the presence of the Holy Spirit today? You feel his presence, Amen. Amen. You can be seated just for a moment. We're going to continue in the word of the Lord. Amen. Jeremy. Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy Brown. Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you, Crystal, Scott. Thank you, guys. Now, I know that you don't believe this, but every now and then a preacher has a rough day. <laughs> and yesterday was kind of a rough day. You know, sometimes you get bombarded and the enemy just throwing a million thoughts at your mind. And um, mm 
It's all about relationships, isn't it? Back and forth. And sometimes we get, we just get bombarded. And uh, yesterday was one of them days where the enemy just kind of, every time I turned around, it was just another thought, another thought, another thought. And you rebuke them and you, and you move on. And um, this morning uh, when we got here, uh, God basically had answered a prayer uh, just a little short time after I got here. And it was kind of like the Lord says, don't worry about it. You tell the people it's under control. So uh, you're supposed to know that it's under control too. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> and we do know that it's under control. But sometimes we get bombarded, and all of us do, everyone in this room. There are times when things just hit you, and you just kind of go like, whoa, where'd that one come from? And then we realize it came from the enemy, and uh, we get victory over it, and, and we move forward. And uh, I just give God all the glory for everything. And I thank him for each of you, because you're very, very special, you're very important. And Ben, the word is very true, to be planted in the house of God, and because that's the only way we can flourish, is if we plant Many of you have so many incredible giftings in your life, and uh, the church needs them, the world needs them, and your church needs them as well. And when you're planted in that house of God, uh, those gifts are able to flourish and be a help and be a blessing one to each other. Um, Jeffrey, you got your Bible? Jeffrey asked me this morning if we'd pray over a brand new Bible he's got, and I said, why, sure. I'm going to pray that all that jumps right out of those pages and right into your heart and into your mind. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for the Holy Word. Just put your hands on We thank you for the Holy Word of God. We know, Lord, the Scripture says it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And, Father, we know, Lord, that if we will diligently seek you and seek your Word, Lord, we will never be for want in this world. And I pray, God, that as Jeffrey opens this Word and... and puts forth that effort to study his word. Lord, he will be a workman, not a shame, rightly, correctly dividing the word of truth. And Lord, souls will be brought to the cross of Calvary. So we bless the word of God, and we bless Jeff in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Now, can I tell you, uh, this is not a real spiritual thing here. Can I tell you, Jeff, what you need to do with the Bible so you can utilize it really well? All right. Take it. Open it center, okay, to where it's midway, all right? Now, take each page one at a time, not during church. <laughs> one page at a time, and you take it, and you, you crinkle it, and then you lay it over. And you do every page halfway that way, and every page halfway that way. And that way, when you're trying to find a page, eight or nine of them don't stick together. And the Bible opens up real easily for you. So that was free. I didn't charge anything for that, okay? I've wore out several Bibles doing that, I promise you. Amen. This morning, we're gonna, I'm going to take some time and look in the Word of God. Because everything that's going on in the world today, we, we understand that a lot of it is strictly, well, all of it really is in God's control and God's hands. He uses men and, as pawns uh, in order to get his will done and accomplished in the world. Sometimes I look at what people are doing and I realize they probably are clueless as to what they're actually doing. They're just being moved along. God has an ultimate plan. Uh, how everything is going to play out uh, in uh, Europe and not only there but really throughout the world um, time is going to tell us all of that. We do know, according to the scriptures, that in the end time, nations will rise against nations. Uh, we do have prophetic word out of Daniel that uh, powers to be from the north will go down and try to once again annihilate Israel. Um, and in the last few weeks, we've watched 
uh, what started out to be just Ukraine and Russia and how we're watching. Uh, of course, we're involved and in, uh, I think it's what, 32 countries throughout uh, the NATO alliance is beginning involved and now China, uh, it looks like it's getting involved and Turkey's involved. So all of a sudden in just a few weeks, it's escalated from just two nations, uh, one being invaded by another one to literally a majority of the world being drawn into it. And how much that they allow themselves, that's something that I have no answer for. Uh, nor am I going to try to find an answer. That's all in God's hands. But a lot of times when things that are going on the way they are, we get really shocked. And we wonder what in the world is going to happen. What is our part in this? Today, there are many believers on every side. Okay, not just one. Believers on every side. I remember back in the late 60s and the early 70s, um, Nancy and I, we had just started uh, pastoring. Our first pastor was in 1970, 72, somewhere in that time frame. And I remember back then uh, the Greeks and Turks were at war with each other. And we realized and knew that there were born-again believers in Greece. There were born-again believers in Turkey. And yet these born-again believers, because of conscriptions into the military, were going to have to raise a weapon toward another believer. Now that's quite difficult to grab hold of. That would basically be, if I could just kind of put it in a, a nutshell, that would be like me being from uh, Dallas and James over here being from the Lake area and these two areas were at war with each other. I'm a believer, he's a believer, and we would find ourselves at odds with each other, trying to basically kill each other. Now that's really tough. And a lot of times we don't grab hold of how hard it is with what's going on in, in the world around about us. I've shared with you on many occasions, but we have a lot of new families here now, um, a good friend of ours uh, from Cambodia, um, his family was all wiped out during the Pol Pot um, extermination process in Cambodia. And um, after he lost all of his family members, he was preaching one day in the church, and in came a couple of the soldiers that he recognized as being the ones that murdered his family. And he would tell us how difficult that was for him to be able to know, first of all, to know that these are the ones that wiped out his family, but yet at the same time as a pastor and as a man of God, to be able to extend to them forgiveness and the grace of Jesus Christ. Now that's beyond a lot of our comprehensions and our ability to do that. Um, and it was very difficult for him to do that. But by God's grace, he did. And uh, long story how God used the situation. So we, we worry a lot of, about things around us. Right now, we're going through a lot of uh, complaints uh, about uh, the gas price. Uh, every time you go to the gas station now, it's probably anywhere from uh, depending on what you drive, anywhere from 50, 60, 70 plus dollars to fill up your tank. If you're living in Dallas, if you're living here and working in Dallas and you're making that journey every day at the end of the month, that's, that's a lot of money. Uh, you're going into the grocery stores and uh, uh, just bear with me because this really is what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, you're going into the grocery stores and every time you go in there, everything has gone up. And you're just like, wow, I don't know how much more that I can afford the inflation, the rate it's going up. Um, you know, two or three years ago, you could have bought a house for, let's say, in this area, you probably could have got one for 100, 150,000. And now all of a sudden they're crazy. They're $300,000 and more. And you're going like, what happened? Well, I'm not going to get political and. and go down that uh, rabbit trail this morning. But what I'm saying is that everywhere we turn, we're being 
faced with questions of, Lord, what am I going to do? How much more will things rise up, and how in the world am I going to make it? I have these children. I don't, uh, I wouldn't even think about what it would cost to put them in college right now, uh, because it would just be astronomical. Uh, I'm not against college. Uh, I spent a number of years there, uh, but uh, there may be some other alternatives today. So let me turn to Matthew chapter 6, but I'm going to lay a foundation before I get there, okay? If you have your scriptures, I want you to turn to the book of Jeremiah, and I want you to go to verse number 25. Now, we've been talking about Daniel and how God used Daniel. So turn with me, if you will. Now, Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem captive, and they were captive for a certain number of years. And let me get to Jeremiah. Hmm? Uh, Jeremiah 25. thought I had this marked, but just bear with me another moment. How many of you remember the scriptures where the Bible says that the angel of the Lord appeared unto, unto Daniel? And he says, I want you to know that I have been detained for 21 days before I was able to get here. But God heard your prayer the very first time you uttered those words out of your mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of comfort to know that even before the answer is in front of me, that God has already heard my prayer and that he's going to answer my prayer. For those of you that have loved ones that don't know Christ or are not in a relationship with Jesus and you've prayed for them, you have to understand that prayer has already been heard. And God is working a timing in order for that person to come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I had no idea that, uh, Jamie, I really didn't have a lot to do about it. My mom and dad prayed for me before I was even born. So I knew that one way, one day, day that Jesus was going to capture me and I would be a child of God. Heather, even though at one time death tried to take you, even as an infant, your days were already accounted unto God and God said, no, I'm not going to let you die. I have a job for you. I have a purpose for your life. Those prayers were heard even while your dad was uttering them, oh, my daughter, uh, God had already heard that prayer and had already sent an angel to bring life back into your body. That's the power of understanding the Word of God. So here, Jeremiah, Jeremiah is going to spend time, or excuse me, Daniel rather, is going to spend time and he's going to begin to pray to God. And he's going to say, God, I need you to move upon my people. I need you to move upon the house of Israel. And Lord, I don't understand everything that lies ahead, but I'm calling on you. I'm calling on you to touch my people. Now, here's the strange part about that. If I look in the scripture in Jeremiah, and I look at chapter number 25, and I look at verse number 9, 25 verses 9 through 11, I will summon all people of the north and my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, it's really interesting because Nebuchadnezzar, how many of you know, was not a believer? All right, he was an infidel. All right, but God says, you're my servant. And what's that mean? I'm going to use you. Because, see, God can use anybody at any time the way that he desires. Well, I don't think that person is spiritual enough to be used by God. It's not your determination anyhow, is it? It's God's determination. 
Well, I wish that person was more spiritual or I wish they believed more like I believe. Uh, then I know God could really utilize them. No, God will use them at his own time and own discretion. So he looks at Nebuchadnezzar and he says, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to use you. You're going to be a servant for me, and I'm going to bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations around about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. Verse 10. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and sound of the millstone and the light of the candle, verse 11, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon, how long? Hmm. Turn with me now to Jeremiah 29, and if I might put this verse in the context a little bit, I'm going to look at verse number 1 and then verse number 10. Then we're going to run to the New Testament. Okay. Jeremiah 29, verse number 1. You got it? This is a text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders, which were carried away captive. And to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away and captive into Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, rather, to Babylon. Verse number 10. And after that, Jehoiakim, the king, and the queen, and the eunuchs, and the prince. Go to verse number 10, I'm sorry. Yeah. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, and I will perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. Now, look at the first part of that verse. For thus saith the Lord, that after how many years? 70. Now, Ezekiel studied the word of Jeremiah, contemporary prophets. Daniel, before he even prayed, he already knew how long the captivity was going to be. And he already knew the outcome of the captivity. Now, we use that verse a lot. I know the plans that the Lord, if you looked at verse number 10, the rest of that verse, he says, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you and not do you any harm, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, we take that scripture a lot of times out of context, and we say, now, I know that the plans of the Lord for you, and that's to prosper you and give good things unto you. Now, that is the principle that God works in, okay? That God says, no matter what comes your way, no matter what heartache or hardship may come against you, I'm going to work it out for you, and at the end, it's going to be better for you than what it was beforehand. You remember Job, when Job was there, Job had an issue. Job lost almost everything that he had. And God was basically saying, Job, don't worry. Even though it looks like you've lost everything, in the end of your life, you're going to be better off than you were before you lost anything because I'm going to give more to you than you ever lost. That's a principle that God works with, that God will never leave us or forsake us but will be with us always to the very ends of the earth. Now, Daniel understood that the captivity would only be 70 years. And they say that roughly, the historians and the theologians say that when Daniel had this visitation, that they were possibly only a few years away from the 70 years being completed. So my question to you is why, if Daniel knew that we would be in captivity 70 years, if he knew that it was a short time before he would be released and be back in Jerusalem, 
if he knew that the end of it was going to be greater than the former, why did he have to pray? Everybody's got the answer, right? Why, Jeremy, why would he have to pray? He already knew the answer. He knew that it was only going to be 70 years. He knew that they were only about a year and a half away from that, calculating the time. He knew God was going to bless them. He knew God was going to restore unto them. He knew that they were going to be prosperous beyond measure. Then why was it that he prayed and said, God, I need help because I don't understand what's getting ready to take place with the people? Forgot it? For guidance? Okay. Anybody else? As a reminder? Okay. Huh? You have strength and give hope? How many of you realize that every promise in the book, you remember the song you sang as a kid? Darlene remembers it. Every promise in the book is mine. (laughs) Every chapter, every verse, every line. Some of you are too young, okay? Most of you are old enough to remember that, okay? We remember that because the promises in the book, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, are what? Yes and amen? So prayer becomes an avenue and a tool to bring about the promises that God has for you and I. It's a way that you and I build our faith in what God has declared in the Word of God. God has made a declaration that that He is our healer. Well, if He makes a declaration that He's our healer, why do we pray for a healer? Because we are reminding ourselves of the promise that God has made unto us. And every time we pray that prayer, it builds our faith, it builds our faith, and it builds our faith until we come to the point that we absolutely expect God to do what He said He would do. So how many times do we not pray. Well, God's got this. God's got this all covered. God's going to work this out. God's got my family. God's going to save my family, so I don't need to pray for them. No. Every time you pray for them, you are letting God know, Lord, this is your word. This is what you've said. I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm making my petitions known, and it builds your faith, and it builds your faith, and it builds your faith, and every time you look at that one that is not saved in your spirit, man, you see them as a child of God saved and on their way to heaven because you know God will do his work. God will perform his word. Daniel knew that God was going to restore them and bring them back, but yet he still prayed. And it also brought up some things in Daniel. He knew what God was going to do, but at the same time, God used it as a means of forgiveness. Daniel would pray his prayer, his father, forgive me. Forgive me for not doing whatever you've asked me to do or whatever you've required of me. Forgive my forefathers for what they have failed to do. Forgive us as a nation for what we have failed to do. Prayer many times brings up areas in our own life that we need to surrender over unto God. Even though I know the outcome, there are still areas that it causes me to surrender Why do you think the enemy tries to get us to do wrong, to sin? Don't you know that the power of God that's at work in you is able to do above and exceedingly beyond anything you can imagine or ask for? Do you know that God will hear your prayers even if you're not the most squeaky clean Christian on the face of the planet? Isn't that amazing? So what does the enemy do? The enemy tries to make you feel unworthy. So you won't pray. Well, I'm not good enough, or, or 
my life is not what it needs to be. And uh, I was a better Christian at one time than what I am right now. God would never hear my prayer. God won't answer my prayer. Listen, God has already made a declaration that every promise in the book is yes and amen, okay? And he's asked you to put him in remembrance of his word. He's asked you to call out upon him. And while you are yet calling, he hears. And while you're yet shedding a tear, he answers your prayer. The enemy wants you not to build up your faith and have faith in the Word of God, so he brings back all the guilt in your life of things that you do wrong. So if I've done wrong, first thing I do, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for Scott, and Scott's got an illness or a sickness, and I'm going to pray for Scott, and I get ready to lay hands on him. The first thing is, is Paul... Don't you know what you did the other day at the store and you got really mad at the clerk and you said things you shouldn't have said? And all of a sudden, guilt begins to come upon me. And the enemy begins to work with me and say, see, you're not worthy. Or maybe you said uh, a word that you shouldn't have said at the guy who'd run you off the road and, and now you're getting ready to pray for somebody and everybody's smiling at me. Shame on you. <laughs> I don't drive up that road. But the enemy puts guilt and shame on us, so we, we don't pray. And when we don't pray, we don't build our faith in the Word. And if we don't build our faith in the Word, then doubt comes in. And when doubt comes in, generally, we're not going to be able to see the fulfillment of that promise because now we don't believe God's really going to do it. And it becomes a spiral that becomes hard to break. It's called a downward spiral. I remember years ago, I was taking flight lessons from a good friend of mine. And he was a, uh, he did a lot of aerobatics. Uh, and we went up one time and, and we're flying and I did my the ground school and we're going through and uh, he, he was trying to get more hours uh, on his flight and uh, to be a, a multi-engine rating. And so we're going up and uh, he says, hey, we're going to do a few barrel rolls. Well, that wasn't too bad, all right? I left my stomach somewhere in the process of it. And then he said, well, we're going to do a stall. And uh, so he pulls back the yoke a little bit, and all of a sudden we start dropping down, and he lowers the nose, and it picks it back up, and we, we move on. That wasn't too bad. But then he says, you know what? Here's what i got to teach you how to do. He said, if you go in an uncontrolled spin and you don't know how to get out of a controlled one, you'll probably crash. So he pulls it back, and the next thing I know, we're going straight down, and we're spinning. All right? And John, the ground's coming up quite quickly. And the only way to get out of that spin is to step on the rudder pedal in the opposite direction. And you just kind of hold it as tight as you can with as much pressure as you could. And all of a sudden, the plane just kind of almost stops. And he pulls back on the yoke, and you, your nose comes up, and you go on. But see, the, the more revolutions that you go down, the harder it is to stop it and reverse that and come out of it. Well, it wasn't long after that that I quit taking lessons. <laughs> it scared me. The ground was coming up too quick. I mean, when 3,000 feet goes by in a matter of a couple of seconds, <laughs> you're going like, whoa, wait a minute. But what, what it is is when you get into that downward spiral in life, it's hard to stop. How many of you understand what I'm talking about now in that downward spiral? This is not what I want. This is not, this is not where I destined my life to be. But you got caught up in a downward spiral. Do you know how many? I've got some friends of mine that have spent years in prison. Years in prison. They didn't rob a bank. They didn't rob stores. They didn't murder nobody. They didn't shoot nobody or anything like that. But they, they, they got a ticket. 
And then they forgot to pay the ticket. And then there was a warrant for their arrest. And the next thing you know, they skipped bail on, on, on the warrant. Now there was a, a second warrant for their arrest. And before you know it, they spent two or three years in prison over a ticket. It's a downward spiral that sometimes you just don't know how to get out of. Now, many of you in here today know what I'm talking about. It can be debt. It can be something that has to do legally with the law. It can be spiritually. That we get in a downward spiral spiritually, thinking that we can control this all on our own, but we know we can't. And before you know what was a small thing becomes a larger thing, what was a larger thing becomes a gigantic thing, and all of a sudden now, it absolutely dominates and controls your life. And you said, there's no way I would ever go there. No way I would ever do that. And now you find yourself right in the midst of it, and you don't know a way out. Now, I'm talking to somebody, some people here today. You know who you are. <laughs> when you pray, you build your faith in God's promises in the Word of God. Now, let's go to the New Testament, Matthew 6, for a moment. 25 through 34. Now I'm going to look from the New King James Version. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I say unto you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What ye shall put on it? Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Keep going. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Look at your neighbor and say, the scripture says you're, you're more valuable than the birds of the air. Yeah, you are. Are you not much better than they? Next. <laughs> Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit, a measure, that's about 18 inches, to his statue? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Next. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the fields, which is... which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought, thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In the last verse. Oh, no, that's, that's, that is the last one. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Now, Daniel knew the outcome of the captivity, and yet he prayed for God to send an angel and give him understanding. Now, that was the key word. Daniel said, Lord, give me understanding, is what Daniel was praying. I know and I understand what is coming and how we're going to be re 
united together. We're going to be back in Jerusalem. But give me the understanding. Now, Jesus has taken this, and he says, For you as my children, I want you to understand, I have all good intentions for you. I will supply every need that you have according to my riches, which is in glory. I will abundantly give unto you food, clothing, anything that you have need of. I'm going to take care of that for you. But it does not negate us from praying and believing and trusting God for the provisions that he has to give us. God wants you and I to pray. God wants us to believe and trust him for the fulfillment of his word. I thank God every day for what has been given unto me. And even as mundane as it may seem, uh, still bowing your head in the restaurant and saying a prayer over your food and being grateful and thankful for it, not as a habit, but literally thankful for what God has made available to you and I is a way of saying, God, I have faith in your word that you will always be there. You'll always provide for me no matter what the case may be. I thank you for that. And we give praise and honor and glory unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, that's just the opposite of what the world does. The world is so caught up right now, especially because of the inflation. We're caught up with what are we going to do if gas gets to be $8 a gallon. I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to pray and thank God that he's going to make a way for me to be able to afford the $8 a gallon if that's what it comes to. I am not, and please, I want you to hear me. I'm not going to be anxious over it. I'm not going to wring my hands and, and worry myself to death. When we were in California, before we came back here, we lived about 40, about 40 miles from church to where we were living at. We drove out there Sunday morning. Uh, we drove out there Wednesday. We drove back out there on Friday, and sometimes we went out on a Saturday. So we were driving at least four times a week that we were driving, going back and forth. Now, at that time, gas out there was around $4.55, $4.60 a gallon. All right? So we were putting several hundred dollars a week in our gas tank just to get back and forth to church. I never worried about it. Because I knew what God had called us to do, and God always made a way to do it. But every day, I would thank God for it. I would go in prayer, Lord, thank you for meeting every need that we have today. Thank you, Lord, that your word has promised me. To, are you understanding how we're praying now? Did you, did, did you grab hold of that shift? I'm not saying, Lord, how in the world am I going to make it how can I get to church this week? How in the world can I go back and forth and do my responsibility? I, 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 I just don't know how I'm going to do it at $8 a gallon or $5 a gallon. Father, I thank you that no matter what it is, you're going to make a way because you have promised me that what you started in me, you're going to bring it to completion, and I'm going to give you honor and glory and praise for doing what you said you was going to do. <clears throat> there has to be a shifting in our prayers. We have to shift from a point of knowing what God has provided for us to thanking him for what he has provided for you and I. I remember one of the hardest situations I, I faced was uh, at Parkland where we had a young man. He was 18 years old. Uh, the house had caught on fire. And uh, when I went up to the room, uh, his head would look like a medicine ball. Don't mean to be graphic, but it did. And uh, his mother was there, and they were getting ready to pull the plug uh, off of life support. And I remember putting my arms around her, and I remember praying, Lord, how in the world do I make that transition? How in the world do we transition from this point of, God, I don't want to lose him. God, this ain't right. God, this ain't fair. How do I make that transition from that over here to saying, God, thank you 
for the time that we had with them. Thank you, Lord, that they had an impact in our life. Thank you, Lord, for every life that they touched while they were on this planet. It was making that transfer and that shift was one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life up to that time. And that's how we have to be in prayer. We're so geared to looking at the material thing. We're so geared to wondering how in the world we're going to make it. And if you listen to CNN and all of the news channels, I don't care which ones they are, Fox included, forgive me, all right, all of them, they're bombarding us constantly with woe and doom and how are you going to do it? How are we going to make it? It's all going to tumble and crash. Somewhere we've got to come from that understanding to thank you, God, that I will not want for anything. God, you will supply every need according to your riches and glory. You'll clothe me. You'll feed me. You'll provide for me. And I thank you for that. It shifts our focus. And if there's ever a time Christians need to have their focus shifted, it's now. Because the world is going to come at us even stronger. So we've got to be focused and geared unto God. The world runs counter to what God desires. The general notion about God is that God is the God of the huge eternal things. And he's not the God of the small things. (laughs) Well, God controls the universe. Yes, he does. But the Bible also says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. So this God that controls the universe goes before you in your daily life. It says, I don't want you to go left. I want you to go right because left's going to be harmful to you. But if you stay right and you stay on course, your life's going to have a dramatic change for the better. God understands the outcome in your life. And yet we're trying to constantly take that away from God and do it on our own. And doing it on your own won't work. So we look at the, we look at the Scriptures It's not how much we own in this natural world, but it's it's who you are. Did you realize you are a blood-bought child of God? Did you realize that Jesus died on the cross for you? Because, see, I don't know if a lot of Christians have really got a hold of that. Because if you realize the creator of all the universe, the creator of all time, died for you on a cross, that you would, be ha- you would have life, I think we would appreciate the life that we have a little bit more. And we would be excited about what God is doing in our life. And we wouldn't feel so neglected or abandoned sometimes like we do. We wouldn't feel like some of the prophets, Ezekiel, who goes out and sits in front of a cave or under a juniper tree and simply says, God, I'm the only one left out here. I wish I'd have never been born. I don't think there's anybody in this room that says they wish they'd have never been born. Well, I take that back. There might be some. And that's because you don't understand who it is that died for you on the cross. You don't understand the the sacrifice that was made by the Father to send a son. The sacrifice that the Son made to come for you and I. Daniel knew the outcome, yet he still prayed. Jesus tells us the outcome, outcome, but we're still encouraged to pray. We're still encouraged to put God in remembrance of his word. Lord, this is what your word has declared. And I stand on your word. God provides on the basis of grace and not work. Well, if I was as good a pastor as Skip was, God would probably have blessed me more. Or we look at our neighbor, if we say, if we were as gifted or as talented as that person, maybe God would favor me more and give more to me, more provisions. I mean, I'd give anything if I could play guitar like Jeremy and Scott and half the other people in this room, Ben and Danny and everybody that plays the guitar out there. 
But aren't you glad that God does not reward us and that God does not provide provision for us based on our work? <laughs> but it's based on His grace? If someone walks in this room and they've, they've never been inside of a church house in their entire life, they have no relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then there are sometimes I've come across people who have never even heard the name of Jesus. In remote areas around the world, never heard, it, never heard the name Jesus. But do you know that God would give and meet and provide for those that call upon him, even if they've only known him for a split second? God doesn't measure it. Well, this person has known me 25 years. This one's worked for me for 50 years. This has worked only, well, they've only been at it about 20 minutes, so I'm going to give this one more. No, he gives it by grace. Because he loves you and cares for you. And no matter what time it is that you are serving him, whether it's been a lifetime or it's only been a few moments, his grace is sufficient to supply every need that you have need of. And you're his child and he loves you and he will not abandon you. It's like looking at a little Melanie there. How old is Melanie? Four months? Three months old. How old is your son? Nine and, seven. Nine and seven. It would be God saying, you know what, Brittany, I love you, and I love your children, but your sons are nine and seven, so they deserve more than Melanie does because she's only three months. God don't function that way, does he? He don't function that way. All of them are his children. And all of them are worthy of the Father. And if they're worthy of the Father, they're worthy of whatever the Father has for them. They're not old enough yet to pray and get, well, the boys should be, but the baby isn't. So, Mom, it's your responsibility to pray for her. See, God measures it on grace. Not on what we work or what we do. If he measured it on what we did in our works, some of you would be super wealthy and some of you would be borrowing from the lender. Now, don't get mad at me when I say that. I'm just telling you the truth. Because we all don't work at the same level. Different people work in different ways. But God doesn't use that as a measuring rod. He loves you. His grace is sufficient for you. <clears throat> and he'll supply all of your needs according to his riches. We're getting ready to close. Hand me that water now. The kingdom is a realm of provision. Oh, I didn't see that there. Philippians, and my God will supply all of your needs. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 and 12 and God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel unto good works. I'm going to give you everything that you have need of. It's done by grace. Why? Well, because I, I like the way you combed your hair today. Or you didn't comb it today. I like, I, like, I, just, I like the way you act and the way you talk. No, I want all grace to abound unto you that you might be able to do what? Do what? Do good works. Because I've created you to do good things. Before the world ever was, I created you to do good works. And I want you to have all sufficiency... To excel in everything. So I'm going to make sure you have everything you have need of. Why? I want you to excel in everything that you do. It's not going to be done by your works, but it's going to be done by my grace. 
God is going to supply the needs for you and your household. We need to shift our prayers to begin to thank God for all things in advance. I thank you, God. Isn't that what Jesus did when he walked up to the tomb of his friend Lazarus? See, the Bible says even before he called him forward out of the tomb, he thanked God, he thanked his father. Father, I thank you. And after he thanked his father, he called Lazarus out of the tomb. And Lazarus came out. Even though we may know the outcome, always pray. Even though you believe with all of your heart that all of these things are going to line up just like this, and you've got the Word of God behind you, pray. Give thanks unto God. Worship Him. Glorify Him. And watch what He begins to do in your life. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I have different ones contacting me this last few weeks constantly from overseas. And, you know, they're concerned about buildings and stuff like that. And I just simply say, if, you know, if it's God's will that we have it because you opened the door for it, Lord. And God, you've got to take care of it. I did the legwork. The guys over there in Nigeria did the legwork. Well, God, you've got to pay for the building. And the only way God can pay for the building is he's going to move on the hearts of people. And God's going to take care of it. But I still pray every day. Lord, thank you. Thank you for a Christian doctor that wants to sell his hospital. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to make this available to us. Thank you, Lord, that I found my money this week that I thought I lost. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And God will do what he said he will do. My challenge to you today, look at how you pray. Because most of our prayers, if we're not careful, are prayers of doubt. They're prayers of discouragement. Turn them around to prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of gratefulness unto God. And watch God change things in your life. God will do it. God would give us, we was on a trip one time, Nancy and I was, and we were supposed to go to a certain area. It's in a little area called Epal. Um, and we knew God wanted us to go there because he put it on our heart. And we did go there. And we had a great time. We had a great move of the Holy Spirit. But in prayer, even though I know we were to go there, I went to our director at that time there, and I said, uh, I'm putting it in your hands, because that had a lot of riots, a lot of things that had been going on. And I said, I'm putting it in your hands. I know we're supposed to go. God has told me. I've seen an outcome of it. But I'm going to put it in your hands to pray. And he come back, and he told me, he said, Paul, I've prayed, and we need to go but we need to postpone it for a day. So we remember that? So we postponed it for a day. When we got to Osami's city, you get a ferry, and the ferry takes you from one point to another point where we could drive the rest of the way. Well, we got across the ferry, and we got down to the stadium to where we were going to do the meeting, And the day before we got there, when we were supposed to be there, a bomb had went off in the stadium. And God spared our life one of many times. I knew the outcome. I knew God wanted me to go. We both knew that. But we still prayed. And we still had others praying for us. And in the midst of that, God gave a revelation to our director. Don't go yet. Postpone it a day. It probably saved our life. We was on a ferry one time, and the same thing happened. We missed the one ferry. 
We missed it. And I was so aggravated because I missed the ferry. You've never seen me in the airport. If you see me in the airport, you'll know why. All right? They tell me I turn into a different person. <laughs> Especially when you got 30 or 40 teenagers with you. And there was a bomb again on that ferry. And they pulled right up next to the bus. And the ferry got out into the water and the bomb went off. And there was about 60 or something murdered, killed on the bus. God told us not to go. I knew the destination, knew where God wanted us to go. But we prayed. And again, God spared us. And those of you that have been here long enough, you know that there's many, many stories like that. Pray. Change your prayers from, oh God, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Oh God, save my son. God, thank you that you shed your blood for my son and my daughter and they will and they are coming into the house of God and they will spend eternity with me in heaven. Change our way of praying and believing God. If I look with the natural eyes, there's a lot of things I would go, oh, God. But because I see in the spirit realm and I see through the word of God, I say, thank you, God, because I know what you're doing. And I know, God, how you're going to touch these hearts and these lives and your kingdom is going to be built. Deborah, I thank God for you. You're a, you're a, you're What's the word I'm looking for? You're a spark plug. You're a spark plug. Thank God for all of you. Would you stand with me? Thank you for being here today. I love you so much. God is so good. I don't know, I mean, we've had such a powerful praise and worship service and time in the altar. This morning, if you're here and you've had difficulty in praying, And you've always prayed from that desperation of need. Turn that to a heart of thanksgiving and gratitude to God. Because in the back of your mind, you may not know what's going to go on. You may not know everything that's going to happen. But you do know that God is going to do it. Because he said he would. I pray all the time for the house to be packed to the gills. And I thank him for it. I thank him because even this morning, though we have empty chairs, I don't see them as empty. I see somebody in them. And I know God is bringing them. So thank you, Lord. So just in the next few moments, what I'd like for you to do is just pray a prayer of thanksgiving unto God. Thank Him for your husband. Thank Him for your wife. Thank Him for your children. Thank Him for the church. Thank Him for all the awesome elders that we have here. Thank you, Lord, I thank you for all the workers. But most of all, I thank you, Lord, for your salvation and all that you've made available to me. So let's take a moment and thank Him. Everybody, just just begin to pray. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you, Lord, today for this congregation. I thank you, Lord, for each heart that is here today. I thank you for all the children in the back room. I thank you, Lord, for the workers in the back who are willing to give of their time and teach and share with these children. Lord, I thank you for every first-time visitor that's here today. And Lord, I pray, God, that every need that they have 
I thank you because I know that it will be met by the power of the blood of Jesus. I thank you for our incredible incredible workers. I thank you for our praise team. I thank you, Lord, for Brandon and Dennis and Emma that work in the sound booth so faithfully every week. Lord, giving of their time. I thank you for them. I thank you, God, for my precious wife. I thank you, Lord, for touching and healing her body this last week. I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in her life and in my life. I thank you, God, for all the finances that come into this local body that enable us to do what we do for you. I'm thankful, God. I'm so thankful, Lord, that all of our provisions are met and supplied through Jesus Christ. And, Lord, you move on the hearts. I thank you, God, that, Lord, we're going to raise the sign on the hospital in Nigeria. I thank you, God, that you're going to go before us and meet every need. I thank you for that, God. And, Lord, I just thank you. I want to thank you so much for everyone that's here this morning. Lord, I wish I could express to them how special they are and how much we love them. Even We may not even know them all that well, but, Lord, you put a love in our heart, a love that is of you, to where we can look at a stranger and still love them with the love of Christ. Thank you for that. We give you praise. Now look to your neighbor and say, I thank God for, for you and that you're here today. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for our crowd this morning. Next week, let's make it even more so. Let's Find somebody. Go to the highways and byways and compel them to come in to the house of God. And let's fill the house. Amen. We have a sweet spirit here, sweet worship. And we just love, we love each of you so, so very much. Amen. Pray for uh, my son, Joel. He'll be heading to the Philippines here in, in this week. We bought the Elf this week. And the Elf is a little pickup truck uh, type thing. And uh, we got it. The container uh, has already left Long Beach, a 40-foot container with 23,000 pairs of shoes. We got another one coming out of Singapore, and we're giving God glory, and they're making all the arrangements right now. And um, we're just really thanking God for that. Your prayers uh, and the prayers of this church and the prayers and the finances uh, is making these things possible, and we give God the glory for it. Yes, ma'am. What's, it, what's his first name? Archer? Well, oh, Father, just touch Archer right now. I thank you, God, that you go before us. I thank you that you are the healer. I thank you, Lord, that you'll put this jaw all back in place. Lord, there will not be any issues with it later in life. And, Lord, that scar tissue will heal and men. You are the Lord God that healeth us at your word. I thank you, God, for moving on behalf of Archer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Mark, where are you at? We decree. We decree.